right, we are going to take the BQ B1 and make it able to print nylon. Now, some of you will say, but it can print nylon out of the box, and that's mostly true. Um, we're using a PTFE lined hot end stock, and you know, above 250 degrees, depending on the type of PTFE, it starts to break down. Uh, you can end up having it like clog inside the hot end as it kind of deforms and melts. Um, you can alleviate some of that to a degree, about 270 degrees, I think, uh, with a Capricorn tube, uh, which is also slicker. Um, but in this case, I'm going to convert this to an all metal hot end, removing the PTFE from the edge of the nozzle, essentially. Uh, it'll be about an inch up. Uh, and I'm also gonna make it a volcano hot end in doing so. So we're lucky in that it uses the same, um, the same uh, heat break as a Kraken. Um, fits in there perfectly, it'll be held in with the set screws, and then that allows us to use any of the E3D heater blocks. Like I said, I'm gonna use a volcano on this. Um, and under here, we have like a daughter board, and that's what the USB-C leads to. So all of our connections terminate inside this hot end here, making it super easy for us to plug in an E3D thermistor as well. Um, so without further ado, let's start taking this apart. All right, so with the printer off, of course, disconnect the USB-C cable. And if you're lucky, you'd be able to depress this and pull um, the PTFE out. But if the machine's been used for any length of time, that's likely not gonna come out easily. Um, so I'm going to unscrew the coupler here. So you can see the tip is already starting to deform a little bit. Um, that may not be due to heat, uh, that just may be due to how it was installed, but that's the type of thing you'd see there um, over time as you run high temperature materials. All right, so now we're just gonna remove these two bolts here and that will detach the entire hot end assembly from the X carriage. All right, so we're going to remove um, this cooling duct that routes from both of these fans. Um, because the volcano is longer than this, we won't be able to reuse this, but I have an STL that someone else has created that extends these cooling ducts to match the length of the volcano uh, hot end that we're gonna install here. Make sure you keep these tiny, tiny screws uh, safe somewhere in case you ever wanna reinstall this. Now, when we're printing nylon, typically we're not using the cooling fan at all. Um, so in the immediate term, I'm not even going to install that extended cooling duct. Uh, it's simply not gonna be used on this machine for me. And I now have four of these B1s, this will be the fifth, uh, that are set up this way, specifically for printing mostly nylon and, uh, and some ABS, again, which I don't use the cooling fan for. All right, with those four removed, this guy pops right off. And now we'll unscrew this little backing plate here. Uh, it's a little bit of a bigger Allen key. So just these four. And both the backing plate and the uh, PCB will, will come out. Now, we don't have a whole lot of slack in these wires. Uh, and because we are going to be removing both the uh, heater and the thermistor. Uh, I'm gonna actually snip these uh, little zip ties that are in here. Just be very careful not to clip any of the wires as you're doing this. There we go. Perfect, okay. So this large red one here is the heater. Um, we're not going to change the heater. We're gonna use the stock heater. And then on the opposite side, we've got TH0, that's the thermistor. Pull that guy out, okay. And then on the back of the heat sink on the hot end, we've got two set screws. So using your tiny Allen key from the uh, fan screws before, just loosen those. And the entire heat break and hot end uh, heater block and nozzle will come out. We're not gonna reuse any of this we're just gonna take the heater out of the block. This uses the pinch style little bead thermistor. And so the E3D 
uh, blocks all use the cartridge style thermistor. So we're not gonna reuse the thermistor. If you have a, uh, you know, a cloned volcano hot end maybe that still uses the pinch style, then you can feel free to reuse it. Uh, and in that case, you won't have to touch the firmware at all because you're not changing the thermistor type. In our case, we're changing the thermistor type, so we're gonna need to reflash the mainboard firmware. All right, set that guy aside too. And so here, we're gonna cut through this Kapton tape and we'll remove the thermistor from that bundle. So now we've got the heater cartridge separated and I'm gonna open up the E3D thermistor. And so the official E3D thermistor comes with a Molex connector on the end there uh, and an extension cord to, you know, to go to your board. In our case, because of the daughter board here, we're lucky we don't need any of that. And we're even luckier in that although this Molex connector is not the same as the JST, I believe it is, connector that this is meant for, it happens to plug in here nice and firm. A little wiggle. Don't make a liar out of me. All right, there we go. So it plugs in there nice and firm. And uh, I mean, it's not coming out. If you're really concerned, you could add a dab of hot glue to make sure that that stays, stays put. But, uh, but trust me, it'll be fine. If you're using a DuPont connector, maybe you're crimping on your own onto some other thermistor, um, I find that those are a little looser, um, so you'll, you'll want to use hot glue. And obviously, if you have them, using the appropriate connector would, would be the best bet. So with the heater block, this little notch um, goes towards the heat sink, so towards the top of the heater assembly. That means that that is where our heat brake screws in. And unlike the stock heat brake, the stock heat brake, as I was mentioning, the PTFE goes all the way in and touches the back side of the nozzle, right? So it's very hot in there. In the all metal, it only goes in, you know, maybe four or five millimeters. And then it's just all metal from that point on. So it keeps it much further from the, the, hot, the hot areas. So like I said, with the notch, we're gonna screw in the heat brake. And then on the opposite side, I'm gonna screw in the volcano nozzle. Um, we're not printing abrasive nylon, you know, it's not carbon fiber or glass fiber or anything like that. Um, so a brass nozzle is totally fine. And in this case, we're printing with a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. So we're able to do much fatter lines and we can even do thicker, thicker layers uh, to reduce the print time, especially if we're doing larger nylon parts. So I've just hand tightened those two together. Um, hopefully you can see there's a tiny bit of a gap um, behind the back side of the, the ring on the, uh, on the nozzle and the, the heater block itself, um, maybe half a millimeter or something. Um, and so we don't want it to be sticking way out. Um, and in the, in the case of the, uh, the heat break, you'll actually see maybe a tiny bit of the top thread there. Um, so the next thing that we're gonna install is this thermistor. Now I could have definitely installed this, you know, before hooking it up to the PCB. Um, but that goes in the little, little narrow slot on the side here with some coaxing. And then we've got a set screw to just hold that in place. Now you don't want to crush the thermistor, you know, just enough tension that it's not going to go anywhere. And then similarly, the um, heater, which you can tell it's well used, uh, is going to slide in here. Now, this is where you want to pay a little bit of attention. Um, I like my nozzles to be closer to the, like to the front. I like the rest of the heater block to be towards the rear here. Um, so it would be positioned essentially like that. And so you want to kind of rotate the, the heater cartridge um, to be able to better route the wires. You know, if it's, um, if they're pointing towards the back, it's kind of difficult. There's not a whole lot of space there. So I'll point them like off to the side a little bit. And then, you know, and then I'm just gonna tighten these two, these two screws here. Now these ones will take a little bit of oomph because um, we're you know, deforming the uh, heater block around the heater cartridge, essentially. And I think my heater cartridge is too far in. There we go. So heater cartridge is basically flush with the top or so. Um, and the thermistor, you know, it's buried completely in there. There's none of it really showing out the back and it's still a couple millimeters in the, in the top there. So as I mentioned, um, I want to position this so that the uh, heater cartridge is towards the back of the unit. Just gives me more room for those wires to clear the heat sink. 
And then those two set screws under there, we're gonna retighten those with the heater block kind of held in this position. Hopefully, <laughs> you can see this, I almost need a, a third hand here. But, uh, it's important to make sure that the, um, the heat break is, is completely bottomed out in that heat sink. We don't want there to be a, a gap or anything in there. And then just tighten both of these. Again, these don't have to be crazy tight. You know, it's, it's not going anywhere. Okay. Now, if you so wish, you know, you can, you can do some wire management, get some tiny zip ties again. Uh, I don't bother, personally. Um, just make sure you're not pinching any of these wires. Um, you know, they're far enough away from the hot bits, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, before I squish all this in, I'm gonna connect the heater cartridge to that connector on the board. There we go. And then, uh, you know, you kind of do have to manhandle them a little bit, but squish everything back in there like that so. And then we need to add this um, little backing plate back on there. Okay. Let's just get one of these screws at least started here. Awesome. Okay. And I am missing one screw. Here it is. So I'm not sure what they've, you know, they've 3D printed this back, backing plate here. Um, and it's really, uh, as far as I can tell, it's really just to um, take up some of the, the empty space between this unit and the X carriage. So this sits more or less flush against that backing plate. Uh, there is a little bit of a gap there, um, but I'm not sure if it's PLA or ABS or what they printed that out of, but uh, I've, as I said, I've been running these that. 265 degrees or so for hundreds and hundreds of hours and it hasn't deformed or anything, so I'm not too concerned. All right, so there's everything. That's what it looks like from the bottom. And you can see um, the thermistor wire down the side, still nicely connected. You can always reach in there with a, an Allen key or something not sharp and just make sure that that's firmly plugged in. So, we're just gonna reverse the steps we took before. We've got these two screws in the top that will attach this to the X carriage. Right here. So, a uh, couple quick notes. Uh, before you go homing your printer for the first time after doing this, your hot end and, and nozzle are closer to the bed now. Um, so you're gonna need to provide some extra clearance. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can obviously tighten the bed down to bring it down further. Um, but on these units at the back here, there's also that adjustment screw for the ZN stop. Now, you don't need to worry about that, that adjustment screw if you have the BL Touch installed. It's gonna use the BL Touch for that. Um, the only thing you have to worry there is to make sure that this screw is far enough away so it doesn't, you know, block you from going down far enough for your, your probe to hit, which I've had happen. Um, but in our case, we don't have a probe installed, um, so we could rise that up to stop us sooner to give us that extra clearance that that nozzle and heat block uh, require, or, or we can tighten these knobs a bunch to bring the bed down or some combination thereof. Uh, but just be, be aware and be ready to stop your printer uh, the first time that you home. And obviously, we're gonna re-level the bed and everything. I'm gonna reinstall the um, Bowden tube. And as I mentioned, it's much further away from the nozzle. And we don't really need it to be this long anymore. Um, you can leave it this length, that would be fine. Um, but in my case, I like to keep them as short as possible. Shorter Bowden is typically better. Um, and we do have some deform deformity on the end here. So the best way to do this is to have a uh, nozzle cutter, or sorry, to have a Bowden cutter or a tube cutter um, that kind of pierces and cuts instead of crushing it. Uh, I don't have one of those handy, um, but I'm going to use a sharp X-Acto knife and a, uh, a hard surface to, to cut this and just make sure that you're cutting that perfectly flush and perpendicular. That looks a lot better. Um, no, no deformity or anything. And we wanna make sure that it is still bottomed out, you know, in the top of that heat break, which it is there. Um, so I, I usually install the tube first and then slide this guy down a little bit. But 
Well, with a little struggling, I got it off. Uh, keeping this depressed while you slide it off is kind of tricky. Um, and in this case, it's kind of eaten a, a little bit of a groove into this. Now that can happen if you you have the Bowden tube installed and then you're twisting this with the tube installed, it'll kind of chew a, a groove in it. Um, and that makes it extremely difficult to get this off. Um, in this case, it's not gonna affect the function of it or anything, but we don't need the um, coupler here to be to be that far up. Uh, okay, so we're, we're bottoming out right about there. I'm just going to leave it like that and thread this in, which I will create a new groove, probably in the tube. All right, so let's connect the USB cable to the hot end. There we go. All right, so with everything Hooked up, let's turn on the printer. We see the fan moving, that's a good sign. <laughs> and it'll take the screen a couple seconds to uh, recognize the board and uh, retrieve some information so it says no printer attached. We'll just wait. There we go. So it's connected and I can see that the hot end is registering uh, 28 degrees, the bed 17. Uh, so why is there a big discrepancy? Well, we changed the thermistor type in the, uh, in the hot end and that thermistor type has a different temperature resistance curve. Uh, that's the reason we need to flash the firmware to let the firmware know it's a new thermistor and read the temperatures a little bit differently. Um, but before we get to that, I'm just gonna move the Z by hand, just spinning the coupler, and we can see that the nozzle bottoms out before I hear the click of the Z limit switch in the back there. Um, so I'm gonna tighten the bed somewhat and I'm also going to raise the screw in the Z-limit um, trigger at the back. So now hopefully you can hear that. As we get close to the bed, you'll hear the Z-limit switch trigger, and that's right before the nozzle touches the bed, so that's good, and we can you know, loosen these a little bit, and we'll do our whole bed leveling routine. Um, so, there are two different firmwares on this machine. There's the Scream firmware, and then there's the Marlin firmware that's running on the board. So, the board firmware is updated by inserting the card here with the firmware.bin file that will compile in Visual Studio.code. Um, you could also get it pre-compiled off of uh, the GitHub if you, if you so choose. Now, BICU's GitHub has an older version of Marlin. I think it's August or October 2020 is when it was compiled. Um, I'm actually going to take their configuration uh, and configuration.advanced.h files, and I'm going to migrate them over to the newest version of Marlin as of this filming. Um, but I'm just going to use the default settings. The only thing I'm going to change is the thermistor type uh, to um, the code that corresponds to the um, E3D thermistor. The screen firmware is similarly updated with the SD card, um, except there's a, a folder of images, uh, a firmware file, and a configuration file. And those will just get straight off the Big Tree Tech GitHub for this screen. Uh, that GitHub is not printer specific, um, it's, it's generic to the screen. Um, but it'll work perfectly uh, with our setup here. Once we have the board flashed and we can properly bring the hot end up to temperature, we need to remember to hot tighten our nozzle uh, into the heater block and therefore against the heat break to make sure that that's all tight right now. It's just finger tight right now, so we wouldn't want to be running filament through here or anything. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to provide you links down below to the configuration and configuration advanced files um, configured exactly as uh, BICU had in theirs, only with the thermistor flipped. So there are the two firmwares we have to flash, right? There's the board and the screen. Uh, we'll start with the board. So we're going to go to marlinfirmware.org and download. Now for our purposes today, we're using 2.0.7.2, which is the latest non-nightly build version. The reason I point that out is the configuration file that we're going to provide in the links in the description below is for this particular version. Um, 
you know, from version to version, they tend to make some changes to the format or the layout of the configuration file, and it may or may not work for you. And you may need to uh, kind of transpose that into the new format, much like I did from their source into this version. So download this and unzip it to a folder. I've unzipped it to uh, the root of my C drive. In Visual Studio, or Visual Studio Code, uh, we need the platform I.O. Uh, plugin, which we've shown in a previous uh, video. You can get that from platformio.org and you can get platform.io now. Um, it's actually in the extensions within um, Visual Studio Code as well. Once you have platform.io installed, that allows you to compile it for multiple different uh, hardware platforms. Um, and you'll see that demonstrated in just a minute. So we're going to open the folder that we extracted the Marlin firmware to. So here's my C drive and I've extracted to Marlin firmware. There's the version, and then this 2.0.x folder. Yep, that's the one. So select this folder here and hit select folder. That will open that entire folder and your window should look like this now. I think I have some updates to do, I'll do those later. Okay, so our two configuration files as always, configuration. Uh, H and advanced, um, and as I said, I have taken their configuration uh, file, the stock configuration file that you can get from Big Tree Tech's GitHub under BigQB1. You have to then follow this link here for the source code for their touch screen, and then the two configuration files are here and here. So I've taken the values from there, tweaked them a little bit. Um, just as far as like uh, the default acceleration. Um, and that's basically it, I think. And I've made them work for 2072. Um, so you can make changes as you see fit in these two files, um, you know, to, to uh, work for your setup. You know, if you have a BL touch um, or some other probe, you might want to, you know, make some changes. Um, you know, I would switch out my extruder stepper uh, driver for a 2209 so I could enable a linear advance. So that's a change that I would make here, um, but that doesn't work uh, well with the default drivers that this comes with. So all we need to do is um, import the configuration files we provide and then go to this little alien head. And this board is a LPC 1768 based board. That's the ARM processor that's on there. And we will be able to build this. Now this will take you know, a minute or two, depending on the speed of your machine. I had already compiled it, so it kind of short-circuited it and only took 19 seconds. Uh, don't be alarmed if this takes you know, one or two minutes uh, for sure. Um, but at the end of this, um, it will make the bin file that we need actually shows you up here, maybe not, uh, but this path, this is relative to where we extracted the firmware, the PIO folder build, and then the platform we built it for. So if we go back to our folder on the C drive, Marlin firmware, Marlin inside here, we see this .pio folder, and we see build, and there's the platform that we saw, and now we have this firmware.bin file. So this is for the motherboard. Uh, copy this to the root of your uh, micro SD card, and then we will insert that in the printer. All right, so with our micro SD card, I'm going to insert it in the side rear slot. And then turn the printer on. So we're not going to see anything happen, really. Um, the screen's just going to take a little bit longer to connect to the main board and report temperatures or anything. Uh, that's because the board's going to see automatically that there's a bin file there and it's going to flash the firmware and then reboot itself. Um, hopefully, when the screen comes back, we'll see uh, proper temperatures reported. You know, there won't be that discrepancy between the bed and the hot end. They should be basically the same. And, you know, that discrepancy was because it had no idea what thermistor we had in there. We changed it on it. There we go. So it's done. Right now the hot end is listed at 22 degrees and the bed is at 20. Um, that is fine by me and uh, we don't have a you know, major discrepancy like we had a few minutes ago. Um, a couple quick points I'd like to note and I will show you a little bit in more detail when we look at the screen firmware in a second. 
The screen by default is configured to connect to the board through serial uh, using a baud rate of 115200. Okay? Um, when you're compiling the firmware for Marlin, you can choose many different baud rates. Uh, I tend to use 250,000 usually. If you choose a baud rate that does not match what the screen has, the screen will never reconnect to the board. They have to be in sync, right? Um, so in the firmware configuration files for Marlin, we've kept it at 115200 so that if you choose not to flash the screen, it will still work perfectly fine. Um, so why would I want to flash the screen? Um, well, myself, I noticed a issue, I wouldn't call it a major issue, but it could be very confusing, especially for newcomers. If you have a probe on here and you're trying to set the probe to nozzle offset, right? Because they, they're not at exactly the same height. There's some difference there. The standard process is that it will home itself in the middle of the bed. It'll probe the very center of the bed. And then when it's done probing the center of the bed, it should move the nozzle to exactly that spot where the probe just was. Uh, and then you do, you know, your paper nozzle offset configuration. The screen firmware would actually move the nozzle the wrong direction after the probing. So the probe is, you know, to the front left of the nozzle here. And so it would need to move the nozzle towards the front left of the bed. It would actually move it backwards. Um, so it was just inversed. Now that happened because the firmware had a bit of a glitch uh, and it's an older screen firmware. Um, so I think it's been updated as recent as three weeks ago from this filming, you know, minor changes. Um, but regardless, that's one of the things that they have definitely corrected. Um, also, some of the UI uh, has a different look and feel and some options. Um, and honestly, just for the probing alone is why I did it. Everything else is just a bonus as far as I'm concerned. Um, at that time, when you're flashing the screen as well, you could feel free to change the baud rate if that's something you're interested in. Um, but with all that said, We've got the board firmware flashed. It knows the right thermistor. I'm going to move the hot end up a bunch. And we're gonna do a hot tightening. So as that moves up, I'll heat up the hot end to um, 270, 270 degrees or so. Um, now it is a bigger heater block that we're heating. Um, I'm not exactly sure offhand how many watts the um, heater cartridge is that comes stock. Um, I know it takes a little bit longer than some of my other machines to heat up, but once it's at the temperature, it holds it steady perfectly fine. Um, as that's heating, speaking of holding temperature perfectly fine, on the screen under the tuning menu, there are some options to do PID tuning. So you can have it automatically um, do a heating and cooling cycles at a set temperature and uh, tune the PID values uh, to essentially have the firmware understand how to modulate the heater uh, to keep your hot end at a consistent temperature. You know, you ideally don't want fluctuations in your hot end temperature. Um, so doing a PID tuning at a temperature, you know, close to what you're normally printing at uh, is not a bad idea, typically, especially when we make significant changes to the hot end assembly. As we've shown in many other videos, we need to make sure that we're holding the heater block so that it's not uh, putting strain on the heat break, and then tighten the nozzle. <laughs> and then we'll just lower the temperature back down. You may find if it takes you a long time to kind of affix your wrenches properly, the temperature of the hot end will drop too, too far down, and the thermal run runaway protection will, will kill the printer, essentially. Uh, you know, not, not kill in a bad way, but like turn it off uh, just to pre prevent a, a potential overheating uh, situation. You know, it's calling for heat and yet the temperature is not rising. Um, and that's really just because a big wrench acts like a big heat sink drawing that heat away. Right? Um, we might want to finish this off with a uh, silicone sock to uh, encompass the whole heater block, uh, just retaining heat better again. Um, if you are going to use that, I'd suggest putting it on before PID tuning. Everything makes a little bit of a difference. I'm just picky like that. Um, but I've lowered it back down to about uh, 230 degrees and I'm going to heat up the bed as well, um, just to 60 or so. And, you know, we're going to do the normal corner leveling stuff um, in a few minutes and I want to do that hot. Um, now, uh, we're going to flash the screen. Um, so first, I'm going to level the corners 
I'm gonna let the printer cool down and then we're gonna turn it off and flash the screen. So in this GitHub, this folder here copied to the SD card root directory um, to update, pretty self-explanatory. And what we're going to copy is the bin file as it pertains to the screen that we are using. And so that would be the version 3.0 b126x.bin. So we'll copy this bin file. We would copy the theme folder that we want. Um, so the unified material theme is what we're going to use. So we would copy the TFT35 folder. So that's one folder, the bin file, the config file, so config.ini, um, and I think that's it, just those three, yep, um, to our SD card. So my, so I've actually downloaded the entire GitHub uh, repo here, and I've made my own little folder um, that contains all the stuff that I would want on my SD card. So as I said, you'd grab the TFT35 folder from the theme that you choose to use, the, uh, the bin file, which is the compiled firmware for the screen, and then the config.ini file. Now, uh, out of the box, the config.ini file will be appropriate for this printer. Um, the baud rate uh, specified in there matches the baud rate that we've compiled the uh, Marlin firmware for. Uh, if those are disconnected, uh, the screen will never connect to your motherboard. Um, but it's pretty self-explanatory and well-documented, um, you know, what, what the different properties in here means. Um, you can change, you know, uh, timeout for the backlight, the brightness, you can change the baud rate, uh, you can turn on and off UI noises, set some defaults. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Feel free to play with it. Can't screw th things up uh, too much. Famous last words. Um, but these three files here are what's going to go on the root of our SD card. So copy and paste those to your SD card, and then we're going to insert that in the front slot closest to the screen. And then let's turn the printer off. You know, it's fully cooled, I've already leveled it, and we're going to insert this into the screen up front here then. And now we'll actually have some sort of indication that it's flashing, unlike the Marlin board. We're gonna see all the images flicker across the screen, the progress bar, um, it does take a little bit, so just be patient with the process. Don't shut off the printer while this is happening. So it tells us, you know, uh, the, the size of the program, the name of the bin file, a quick uh, percentage meter, and then it says updating. Uh, this goes on for a couple minutes, and then we'll see all those images flash. Okay, so I've had this come up on about 50% of my printers. I'm not sure why that is, but it fails every time and it's not an issue. Um, so it kind of makes sense. We flash the firmware and it wants to recalibrate the screen to make sure that you know it, it knows where you're touching. So I'm gonna touch that one, and then I'm gonna touch that one, and then this one, and then I expected the fourth one to be in the corner, but it's in the center, and it's also not a red dot. But I try, and it succeeds. That will also sometimes fail. And it's honestly not an issue. You can just turn the printer off, turn it back on, and you'll be totally fine. Um, so if you poke around in the menu a little bit, you might see some of the images are different than they were before. Um, I don't know exactly which ones, for example. Um, but I know that some of the programming behind what the buttons do, like in the probe offset, has been corrected. Um, so I can go to movement, and obviously home. It's still gonna work. If I go to settings and the machine, uh, we can see this tuning menu. And in tuning, you have the PID tuning that I mentioned, and you can also tune your E-steps. So tuning the E-steps is really cool. It's a pretty simple process, especially if you've done it before. You know, typically we'd measure 120 millimeters. We would ask the printer to extrude 100. We would measure what's still sticking out, which should be 20. And if it's not, we would adjust our E-steps and then do it again. Um, this actually guides you through graphically that process. 
Um, and instead of having to even do the math on how much you need to adjust the e-steps based on your measurement, um, you actually just hit up and down until it says, you know, 20 millimeters was left and you change it to say 19.5 millimeters was left and it shows you what the result in e-step is. Uh, and then you hit save and it saves it to the board. Um, so that's kind of cool. It's one of those quality of life things, just like the probe offset, you can do it manually yourself or you can do it guided with the screen. Um, I'm not the biggest touchscreen fan, I'm really not. I've never uh, seen the need for having anything more than a 12864 standard screen. And with this, I get the best of both worlds. Um, you know, if I want to, I can flip it over to the normal Marlin screen, 12864 emulated mode and have that normal UI that I'm used to with all the menus and the things and the places I'm familiar with. Um, if I want to have a graphical nicer interface, I can use that as well. Uh, but if you're printing through Octoprint or Repicure Server or something, you're really not at the screen very often. So there we have it. We now have a Volcano nozzle. We have a Volcano heat block. We have an E3D thermistor. I can print 0 0.6, 0 0.8, even 1.0 millimeter if you really want to push it, uh, nozzles. Um, and in the case of my nylon prints, you know, I was printing um, 0.72 millimeter wide lines, uh, you know, about 1.2 times the nozzle size. Uh, and 0.24 millimeter height layers. And between those two things, compared to my 0.4 millimeter nozzle and 0.2 layers, I was able to shave like 30% off of my print times. Um, and depending on, you know, the intricacy of the details, yeah, you lose a little bit of corner sharpness and stuff with the wider nozzle. Um, but if you're printing larger items that are, you know, have higher tolerances in, in you know, the, the shape and size that they need to be, they don't need to be super sharp. Um, then you can really save yourself a lot of time and, and headache and, and pump out more parts. Um, my small farm of these is doing well and uh, I think I'm going to add another one to it. Hopefully you found that useful. Remember to like and subscribe, ring the bell to get notified when we upload more videos. And if you have any questions about this, please post them in the comment section below and I'll try to answer all your questions. Thanks for watching.